Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the panel of last resort, and welcome especially to the professors Onida, Dupuis, and Zimmer. Bruno Zimmer, he was judge at the International Court of Justice at the decisive time. Professor Zimmer, if you were legal advisor of the German government today, what would you tell Berlin to do? I've never been asked by Berlin what they should do. But let me say that the, I was the German judge in that case. I had a human rights past, if you want. Uh, Alain Pelé counted me among les droits de l'homiste, and then you are, you face that case. And you come up with the, uh, with the, with the majority in favor of uh, immunity from jurisdiction. And I think there, has not, there hasn't been any other case, including genocide or the wall opinion, about which I have thought more even after leaving the court, more or less almost every day. And that's why I find it important to once again look, draw your attention to something that has been mentioned many times, but maybe to a different audience. That the paragraphs in the judgment where the court says, legally speaking, Germany has to win. There is no way out. But, but we are surprised and we are concerned about the way Germany handled the treatment of a very special group of victims of German, let's say, atrocities and actions in, in World War II. Uh, surprise and regret, and then we had this discussion whether the, the sentence by the, by the court nothing would be in the way, the governments could enter into negotiation, whether the could should be given, the should be replaced by a should. Uh, my, I think it's no secret, but that was, we spent two hours, two hours about the could or should in the court. And personally, I was in favor of the should, but there were other people who said, we have to be more careful, ne ultra petita partium and all that stuff. Okay, so that is the situation. Uh, the court was right. I think there was no other way to decide. Immunity is something which is lex lata, and we need immunity. And therefore, my, I, my thought looking at this uh, thing was maybe instead of saying remedies against immunity, we should, we should entitle this uh, exercise as remedies to help living with immunity. Because immunity is not a sickness like uh, living with uh, malaria. It is something we need but we need to, let's say, uh, help living with it. Um, and, and therefore, um, I think the, uh, what I thought of and what I would very much plead of would be an act of what Dagmar Koenig yesterday said, and uh, this morning, I think Karin Oehlers also used the term, a generosity, generosity, an act of generosity. There was a lot of uh, things said about dogs biting and barking, and I think at the moment the two governments are kind of facing each other uh, without biting formally and without barking, but not doing anything, which is also a threatening uh, posture for two, two dogs. I think somebody has to break that deadlock. I find this is a, this is a, 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 a situation of ossification of legal positions. We have heard them ad nauseam. It is uh, some kind of a constipation. We need to we need to overcome that deadlock. Unfortunately, I wasn't here on Thursday because, for me personally, Thursday would have been the most interesting part. Because apparently, on the first day of the colloquium, you uh, discussed possible solutions, and then on the second part, you discussed the problems. So maybe I would have preferred the uh, <laughs> the problems kind of this, and then talk about the solution. I find the idea of a common fund something I would really. I would support that idea very much. I was very much impressed by Filippo Fontanelli saying that the Italian government should go ahead and the German government should match it. Because I think the Italian government is, at least the German government is at least here. They, 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 they take a view, they state their view from Italy all kinds of interesting people and good friends, but where is the Italian government? Of course, I don't blame them. The entire exercise since 2009-10 was an exercise where two countries, in a way, got together and said, the only way we can keep our judges, let's say, 
at, at, at a leash is to go before the ICJ. We cannot go together, which we would very much prefer. So one has to sue the other. A very strange and unsatisfactory position. Um, about German, let's say, the German side. I happened to read Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung of yesterday, of yesterday. <laughs> and you know what the headline is? The headline is, that Germany can uh, count on 54 billion euros uh, in uh, more taxes than expected until 2021. How about devote 1,000, 1,000, 0.1 percent, or maybe 0.2 percent of that surplus, and, and, and really, let's say, indicate to the Italians, come out, come out of your hole. Uh, you go first for the reasons that I mentioned and we are going to match it and we are going to have a fund and people can apply to that fund. They should not just, it not, should not just be a matter of uh, financial compensation because I really admire those before which said, I don't care for 5,000 euros. This is a matter of dignity. And so I very much, I very much like the idea of uh, the, the giudice del, del, del Tribunale di Firenze who is in the audience to say, to offer to the, say, could we have a, a study, I think, or a study or a, a trip to Germany or something worth 15,000 euros? An idea which I find very, very constructive, very much in favor of legal peace, but unfortunately not taken up by either side. So come on, come on, let's overcome that deadlock. Thank you. Normally he's reading a South German paper, that's why I appreciate that you read the correct one now. But one more question after our keynote speech. Um, might this act of generosity, which you favor obviously, lead to an opening of Pandora's box regarding all the different cases uh, Professor Tomuschat was talking about? I would say that most of the most of victims, let's say, I mean, first, what would be necessary would really be this idea maybe of a list that the Italian government, who is of course nearest, closest to the people, would establish what, what kind of victims do we have. On the one half, you have the military internees uh, for the exclusion of which from the general German, uh, let's say, compensation scheme, uh, international legal reasons were given, which, which were correct. Uh, I don't like them. I don't like the outcome. But then you have the civil, the civil victims, like Mr. Ferrini. Uh, and they were, they are, I think, they, they are even the most, uh, let's say, most affected of the outcome of all that, of the lack of compensation, etc. So a careful, let's say, selection would have to be made or list would have to be made. Um, and if I, if there is a boomerang effect on Germany, well, that's Germany's bad luck. We did these things to people from all kinds of countries, and so we cannot avoid kind of making whole one group of victims because other groups would also stand in line. I'm very sorry, that's not a moral position. You can, of course, try as good lawyers to kind of uh, more or less uh, cut, uh, let's say, tailor a solution so that possible boomerang effects might be uh, as, uh, let's say, uh, unfrequent as possible. But that's the situation I see it. Thank you, Professor, uh, <coughs> Professor Zima. I, I think that Mr. Schäuble has other different ideas about <laughs> that uh, 54 <laughs> billion. Uh, I, I do remember in, in 2008, I was, it was November, I think, and I was in the Trieste where th there was a, a bilateral uh, meeting between the Italian government and the German government. And it was, it was also a funny, a funny day that uh, day. I was there for uh, reporting for my newspaper. And uh, I remember that there were a group of flags in the middle of the square of Trieste, the beautiful square of Trieste. And uh, the Italian flag, the German flag, and the 
and the European flag. And the president of the Consiglio was Silvio Berlusconi. And uh, he did hide himself behind, behind the flags. And uh, when Frau Merkel arrived, he suddenly appeared and said, cuckoo. <laughs> and <laughs> that, that, I think, set the stage for the whole day. And they also discussed about those is this issue of, uh, of uh, because uh, uh, there was before that uh, a recent, I think, uh, decision of the Corte di Cassazione already. And uh, they decided to establish this historian, commission of uh, historians. And uh, I remember also that at the, at the time there was a little bit of excitement about that. But uh, Professor Onida, do you think that that was enough politically, I mean, for uh, dealing with this situation? And we have heard in, this day, in those day, in these days that a legal solution is really difficult probably impossible. Do you agree with that? Thank you. Before, I, I want to apologize to the, the non-Italian participants uh, to the seminar because my English is not so good to allow me to be sufficiently clear and precise. Then I'll speak Italian, and I trust in the good interpreters who we have for your comprehension. I apologize. Dunque, dal punto di vista legale, la situazione è apparentemente non solubile. Okay. There is apparently non addressable because uh, there is an international court or judgment whereby Italian judges may not exercise uh, their jurisdiction. The Italian parliament uh, had passed a law whereby Italian judges were not allowed to, to deal with this subject matter because there was a judgment of the International Court of Justice. But then the Italian Constitutional Court intervened and said that uh, judgment uh, ran against not so much the Italian Constitution, but rather the supreme principles of the Italian legal order. Principles uh, which are not available to judges, uh, no to the normal or constitutional legislator, not even with the constitutional reform uh, could you do that. And that has created uh, a contrast between the two uh, legal orders, uh, the domestic, the Italian order, and the international legal order. This contrast is not a contrast between two, the two governments because uh, the Italian government uh, had fully complied with the judgment of the International Court. Uh, the contrast is uh, on the one hand between political bodies and judges on the other side because in our world and more and more judges uh, then uh, carry out uh, ideas uh, and uh, activities which do not always coincide uh, with those uh, supported by uh, political bodies. In my opinion, the Constitutional Court uh, then is exposed to many criticisms, but also it has a quality. The flaws is that uh, the Italian Constitutional Court has grounded its argument uh, on the um, state and whereby running against the constitutional principles. Uh, then uh, they decided to deny jurisdiction because uh, there is a, a right to have access uh, to a judge also in the international uh, law. And this uh, law would be apparently denied in this case. However, uh, Italian victims have had a judge. It was a German judge, but they were not uh, uh, substantially satisfied. So the real unviable uh, right that was infringed was not uh, their right to a judge, but rather the uh, fundamental right of victims to be uh, uh, recognized as such uh, and to be adequately uh, compensated. I suppose the international court should have said, that, I mean, rather than focusing on Article 24 of the Constitution, namely the right to a judge, uh, they should have focused on the right uh, to recognition and compensation. But I think uh, this uh, judgment has also a quality in that it draws everybody's attention. They're not just uh, relations between states uh, such as state sovereignty and treaties, but also fundamental rights of individuals. 
And in this case, uh, fundamental rights, uh, such as the right to human life uh, and similar, and these fundamental rights seem to have been breached in this case. So I think uh, that their call uh, should uh, lead uh, all people alike, both judges and political bodies, to rethink the matter under this light. I mean, is it true that Italian victims were not adequately compensated for the breach of their fundamental rights to life and human dignity? Is it true? Is it true that uh, military Italian internees were not treated as prisoners of war and their human um, dignity was violated? Because Germany, in a way, I suppose, legitimately, did not consider them as enemies, but rather as uh, traitors. I'm talking about uh, Italian soldiers who were uh, then uh, brought to Germany. So it's not about the jurisdiction, because obviously there is a distinction between jurisdiction. There is also the International Court of Justice sentencing on that. But I think it's about substantive rights. So that's why even international law, I mean, uh, when dealing with genocides or crimes against humanity, there is no longer a separation between jurisdiction. There is the so-called universal jurisdiction. So it's not just about uh, jurisdiction, it's about substantive rights. So what remains uh, now necessary is to find out uh, whether in this case there was enough recognition of uh, these people recognized as victims or whether they were not adequately recognized as such. So this should be paved the way to a Pandora box whereby each individual victim will bring a legal action against the German state. They may decide where to do so in Germany or elsewhere. So by enforcing the common right to be compensated for a wrongdoing caused damage. But, but what I think we need is to open up a dialogue, especially uh, involving the governments of these two states, uh, where this analysis is carried out uh, to ascertain whether there is a, a deficiency in the recognition of fundamental rights. Who is to blame? Is it Germany or Italy? Perhaps uh, they did not properly enforce the 61 agreements. It might well be. So I think that the blame is not just on one side. If we want to create a dialogue, we need to head for a solution whereby the two sides, uh, the two parties involved and their political bodies work together. And each and every one of them should recognize uh, their uh, then uh, guilt and responsibilities because uh, these uh, national socialism uh, massacres uh, were perpetrated uh, in Italy, which was uh, a foreign territory, but then there was uh, the Social Italian Republic was supposed to be a legal government uh, for Italy. So in a way, Nazi massacres are also fascist massacres. So I think that also the Italian state is to at least partially to blame. I think that's the way. We need to acknowledge and recognize mutual responsibilities uh, as opposed to getting entrenched into formalisms, uh, whether they are POWs or not. I mean, have they been recognized the status of uh, war victims because uh, their fundamentals, uh, fundamental rights uh, were so seriously breached uh, that we need to uh, go beyond uh, the bottleneck of international law, which uh, sets forth uh, then the laws uh, or the principles of uh, international immunity. I think that was uh, something we need to owe them. So that's what was done by the Italian Constitutional Court judges. So nowadays, we need to deal with uh, the matter of substance. So we should relinquish any discussion about uh, dualism or differences between uh, uh, national legal orders, and we should try and uh, identify solutions, because I think there are some adequate solutions that can substantively then fulfill their fundamental rights. So it's not so much a right to a judge, but the right to be recognized as victims and to claim for compensations, which are not necessarily those uh, claimed under individual uh, legal actions. So if I understand correctly, you, you think that the solution will be a political solution. My question is, 
do you see any room for the two, one of the two governments or of both of them? Due governi o per entrambi i governi perché prendano l'iniziativa? Definitely so. Why shouldn't there this room for maneuvering, given that these two countries are members of the EU, that they always collaborated, and uh, uh, countries that in their legal order gave a, a greater, imp greater importance uh, to fundamental uh, rights. Uh, in Germany, we do not have, um, the, in Italy, there is no possibility to resort to the International Court for uh, Human Rights. Uh, in Germany, uh, there is. If we uh, consider the primacy of uh, human rights, uh, fundamental rights, uh, it shouldn't be difficult to find an agreement between the two countries, mainly if Italy uh, is involved, engaged fully acknowledging its own responsibilities through a solution that is common, that is looked for together. And Italy might even take upon itself financial charges, uh, a financial burden. Uh, this must be so. This is definitely possible. There is room for maneuvering. And the Constitutional Court simply reminded everybody that irrespective of everything, there are fundamental human rights to be complied with. That Professore Dupuy, supponiamo. Fundamental legal rights of victims are concerned. Again, the question if you were advisor of the Italian government, what to do now? I, I, I thank you very much. Perhaps I could briefly recall uh, where from I'm speaking, so to say. Um, I was one of the defenses of, of Italy in that case. I, I should add before the International Court of Justice, I, I, I would like to uh, uh, add to this that I had been just before twice advocate for Germany in two other cases, uh, one of them with my excellent friend uh, Bruno, and thanks to him, uh, uh, before the ICJ. Uh, I'm not sure I, okay, I, I'll try to get into the role you, you, you asked me uh, to, to uh, play. Um, I, in some way, I would be more comfort, comfortable now than what was the situation when I was acting as an advocate within the context of this uh, ICJ case. Because precisely we would be clearly in a political context, which in a sense make it easier. Um, and I think that this is more or, the less, more or less what the ICJ itself invited us to do in this paragraph 104, which is a, a very uh, a, a thoughtful and interesting one, uh, and which, by the way, uh, could be used, as it was recalled by uh, uh, Judge Sima a moment ago, as the basis, the origin for renewing negotiations. Uh, uh, there is no use at this point in time to elaborate a bit more on this, but I think the, the ICJ's decision provides us, uh, although it is not part of the dispositive of the judgment, with a, a, a very thoughtful basis. I would, uh, I must say, for the reasons which were just mentioned by uh, 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 Judge o uh, Onida, um, I would tell the Italian uh, government, because it's your question, Yes, indeed, you should perhaps think, or you could perhaps think. It's a difference. <laughs> I would say I, you could, because I'm, I'm just a lawyer. Uh, you could think of taking the initiative for the reasons which were mentioned earlier by, by, by Bruno, which is simply to 
break the deadlock and to show that you are considering what the Italian jurisdiction, including, of course, the Constitutional Court, had already, already considered, as you uh, recalled it, which was the substantial right of victim to access to an effective reparation. And for that reason, due to the overall context, taking into also consideration our European tradition, where the primacy, uh, the substantial pri uh, primacy of human rights is proclaimed, uh, I would say, yes, indeed, that could be a very thoughtful and uh, uh, efficient sign from part of the Italian government if they would take this initiative. That being said, of course, uh, you uh, place me in a situation which is uh, most of the time, and, and, and thanks God, uh, not the one of a simple lawyer. Thank you. Does uh, justice always have to do with compensation in terms of money? Or could you also think of another way to recognize injustice atrocities? Because, of course, this question about um, what comes next, uh, Professor Zimmer said, okay, bad luck for Germany, may also affect the German, the German government's position. If you, for example, look at the fact that Germany pays a certain amount of money for victims in Afghanistan, bombed victims, and they go there and pay a sum of whatever, for Afghan, uh, $200 or whatever. And of course, they, also there you might say, okay, if this is a, um, a custom, maybe opinion juris, also uh, out of that case situation could arise a certain right, even though those were legal bombings, let's say, but there were victims and the victims are compensated. So don't you see the danger, don't misunderstand me, that they might follow anything out of a common fund and, or should it be formulated like this is an act of generosity, has explicitly no legal um, consequences? Yeah, the problem with journalists is that they, in particular when they are very skilled as you are, is that they go right to the difficult points. Uh, <laughs> and of course you are right, the, 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 the famous uh, Pandora box argument is a difficult one. Uh, I would perhaps say two things. The first is that in that respect, legal techniques and uh, the practice of international law in the field of state responsibility, although we are not here within a purely legal context, could be of help because there is a large scale of uh, options for compensation coming from purely uh, immaterial ones uh, under the heading of satisfaction, which confined to recognizing uh, <clears throat> that there was a breach of the law, uh, and the, in that respect it was a breach of the law accomplished by former Germany uh, uh, towards the uh, IMI. Uh, and ranging to a series of solutions going until the uh, true repair, uh, reparation, uh, with uh, the allocation of funds uh, at least to uh, a common body, uh, another issue being the one of uh, distributing uh, the uh, money, which in that case could be uh, um, uh, 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 provided by both governments, uh, uh, to the victims. Um, I would say 
perhaps an ele elegant way uh, to act would be not, well, it can go two sides. I mean, you could say, uh, uh, as uh, Bruno Sima just said a moment ago, in order to limit the dangers of the Pandora box, you could establish and even motivate why you establish a determined list of victims and try to find a very precise set of criteria. Uh, that could be an option in order to limit uh, and to precise uh, the basis on which uh, such a repair uh, could be provided, but it would be a very difficult task, I'm afraid, and it would uh, oblige the two uh, countries to get into uh, confrontations which c can be a, a bit difficult. Another way would be to say we, we don't get as far as the agreement between the two countries is concerned. We don't get voluntarily not into this uh, 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 task. We leave it to the country of the victims, in this case Italy, to establish the criteria on the basis of which it will then uh, 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 spread, so to say, the repairs, reparation between the victims. We leave it to Italy uh, to establish the uh, 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 criteria, uh, making it possible to uh, 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 categorize the victims. Um, but we uh, simply establish by the agreement uh, a fund which will be uh, 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 then funded by them. There was uh, recently, and it was alluded to it uh, yesterday by our colleague uh, Riccardo Pavoni, there was um, end of 2014 an agreement between the United States and France. Uh, and it was an agreement which, under which a, 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 a certain amount of money uh, was uh, provided in that case, only by one of the two states, uh, namely France, uh, because what was at stake was the role of the French railways uh, during the Second World War in conveying the poor victims to the camps. Uh, but, uh, of course, this is not at all binding. What I mean is that one could really think of a fund with a substantial budget um, uh, which would have also the interest of uh, respecting uh, the dignity of the victims, as, as it was alluded to earlier. Um, uh, my inclination at this uh, time, at this point in time, would be perhaps not to uh, tell the two uh, teams of negotiators that they should necessarily embark upon the establishment of a clear set of criteria, because that would bring us back to the difficulties of the law. But at the same time, I recognize that in order to limit uh, uh, this practice and the scope of this practice, that could, be, could, uh, could have an interest. Thank you. Actually, I agree with almost everything Pierre has said from at the level of the technical and legal, let's say, uh, precautions and uh, et cetera, rules to be. I'd like to make a, a broader point, and I think I'd like to refer to something that Valerio has said uh, about the, I, this, we, are the, we are two core states of the European Union, of a union who is in danger not just from outside, but also from inside of falling apart. Whatever ha will happen to that European Union, I hope that Germany and Italy will remain in the core. And just the idea that two member states so close geographically and will not be able to, to, to deal with that problem, 
but throw legal, let's say, show arms, show the legal arms, as has happened yesterday, is to me just um, bizarre. It is, it is bizarre, and it is really uh, sad. It is sad. So I think, to me, I was a little disappointed. There were a lot of people speaking about European, the European solution, and the European, uh, Frank Sinatra, the European way. But to me, the European way would be something not, not linked to Let's say some, let's say some EU regulation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The European way is: we have in common the the primacy of individual rights, of human rights, and therefore we need to settle that among ourselves as friends and believers in human rights. And let's not wait for some of these people to appear before an, a U.S. court, as happened in the Franco, let's say this thing, and then you have a U.S. court forcing Europeans to finally settle and pay, as it happened with regard to Germany in the year 2000. The, the main reason for that big fund was not an exercise in mor mor morality on the part of Germany. It was uh, the, the threat of legal, uh, let's say, uh, um, activities in the United States, which, which, have, uh, ma which would have made some leading uh, uh, German firms uh, into bankruptcy. That led to the establishment of that fund. But do we really need the Ameri do we need American courts to get us to that point? I hope not. I totally agree with uh, what uh, Judge Sima said. And let me add something. It's not about uh, budget or financial money. It's not about having enough money to compensate these victims. Because it's not so much uh, giving money to people, but first of all, it's to recognize their status as victims. So even 2,500 uh, euros so may be far too much for an individual. It needs to be a symbolic compensation. But what matters is for them to be recognized that their status uh, as uh, carriers of a fundamental right, which was uh, breached because of what Italy and Germany did. So that was breached. And this uh, solemn and official recognition by both states together, in my opinion, uh, would uh, almost historically, but at least uh, symbolically, then close uh, this argument between the relations between two core states of the EU. Una domanda anch'io. I think that it has, uh, I suspect, it has developed in an internal Italian issue. Uh, since the, the starting, of, of, uh, of the problem, uh, I understand that the Italian governments were, were in favor of the international law solution. There is a conflict between the political standing of the Italian governments and the decision of the Constitutional Court and the Cas uh, Corte di Cassazione. So I think that probably the issue should be also treated in this, in this way. It is, uh, maybe this is the reason also because nobody from the Italian authorities are here today. There is a little bit of embarrassment probably about, uh, about this uh, situation. This is uh, an hypothetic uh, explanation, but uh, so I, I completely agree that two countries like Italy and Germany should solve together, in theory, the problem. I'm pretty sure that probably from an Italian point of view in this political situation, it will be difficult to have, to start an initiative of, for dealing with the situation. So my question is this one. Do you think that for solving a dispute, we need a crisis. A crisis may be a forced sequestration of uh, German assets in Italy. It's my first time at Villa Vigoni and I hope it will not be the last time. <laughs> and I hope there will be the possibility of enjoying this gorgeous uh, <laughs> place and environment together. 
maybe on the basis of the, the legal framework existing, existing today. I, I don't want to say anything about, let's say, the, the politics, the internal politics of the matter in Italy. This is not for me to say. This is a, a matter of politeness and non-interference. And, uh, um, but just as a former judge of the ICJ, the, uh, you, I hope nobody I hope nobody thinks that you would do the International Court a favor of bringing back the case, putting the, the finger into the wound of the, let's say, lack of enforcement powers of the ICJ. You would force, you would force the court to state in a judgment that uh, a judgment it rendered in all clarity was not performed. So please, I, I plead in the name of my present colleagues don't maybe put it up as a threat, but don't ever uh, have recourse to that. It would be awful for the ICJ. You, could, you can do that with the European Court of uh, Justice. You know, then you will get a second judgment, etc. At the end, I hope the, the judicial system of the European Union will prevail. But this is, this is not the case at the level of the ICJ, whose sociological basis is so, is so weak. So don't go to the court. Um, as, as far as I understood the German position, the German position is as long as no execution is uh, being, uh, how should I say, initiated or uh, let's say started, uh, Germany will not just keep, keep silent. That is how I understood things. I don't have any particular insight, but that is what I understood from what I heard and read. Um, and um, I think the waiting for the for some execution and taking of German properties in, um, in Italy, then the, uh, the German reaction going to the ICJ would be a, a legal catastrophe. We are not dealing with Mongolia here or Baluchistan versus Kyrgyzstan. We are talking about two countries, you know, friends. We are all friends. So come on. Huh? I mean, let's be. You, you, can, you can direct that to Rome, I leave that to you. I can only speak for myself and maybe look at Berlin a little. I think that the solution to fourth person jurists, the Italian judges may judge, but they are uh, judgments uh, won't be executed is the worst uh, solution because it's uh, hypocritical because it does not come to the substance of the issue. I mean, to decide uh, whether there is uh, a right uh, to recognition. But I think that the real way is a political one. And I do think uh, then uh, the ongoing uh, political crisis situation in Italy should prevent this from happening. Why should it be so? I mean, if I were to express a dream, as Professor Cassese says yesterday, my dream is that the lead is not taken uh, by one or the other government temporary on power, but rather by the two heads of state, the two um, pres presidents of the republic, who, with their power of representing their respective national uh, unit, uh, so the utmost authority in their own country, may say, ladies and gentlemen, we need to find uh, an agreement uh, to implement a recognition that may be even just uh, symbolical in nature, but that would be a way to close uh, this wound, uh, because there seems to be fundamental rights uh, that were ignored uh, or neglected uh, for maybe legal reasons. And let's recognize them. And then as for practical remedies, uh, I mean, even some uh, Italian judges uh, had actually thought of uh, such uh, remedies, such as you know, a grant uh, uh, or whatever, or a fellowship. Uh, I mean, I don't think these victims expect money. They expect to be recognized. And I think that uh, these two countries could do that. I mean, ideally, you know, these two states and their highest representatives, the two presidents, they should actually make a statement along these lines. That's so to you, maybe this very good question, do we need a crisis? No, no. <laughs> Thank you, no, I, I, I do agree with what uh, Bruno uh, and Valerio just said. Uh, I think a crisis, uh, is always a bad solution because it 
would reopen the contentious uh, uh, discussions between the two, the positions between the two countries. And as we have uh, seen during those three days, um, we have seen the limits of the law and the limits in the law. I don't want to de develop that at this stage, but uh, as we have seen, there is a, a, such a tension between what we thought to be at a certain point the Lex Ferenda and what is for sure the Lex Lata, as it was recalled by the court. Uh, we cannot get back to a crisis which would be first legal and then generate into politics. What I think is, to come back to your earlier question, is that when I spoke of Italy taking an initiative, it, it could be the one which uh, Valerio just mentioned, which would be that the, the, the President of the Republic in Italy uh, just takes the initiative of uh, uh, calling his counterpart in Germany. Uh, initiative does not mean that the one of the two countries which would begin the process would have necessary necessarily to go into details, but to simply uh, ask the other one to renew meaningful negotiations. And then it would be a question of, uh, I would say, um, uh, political communication, in which, by the way, the press plays an important role as well. <laughs> We can open the discussion for the public, especially. Ah. Professor Tenzi. Yeah. Uh, thank you for giving me the floor. I am a lawyer who very much sympathizes with political solutions, and I very much believe that legal solutions sometimes lend, uh, come handy in on politics. And in fact, Danilo, you just recall the Trieste meeting, which issued the Trieste declaration whereby the Italian foreign minister showed his agreement vis-a-vis -vis Germany, bringing the case before the ICJ. The legal tool there seemed to, to be handy for the Italian politics, so let the ICJ solve the issue, the political and internal issue. What we are envisaging here by cajoling some kind of general consensus on the political solution may bring back a déjà vu. We bring going back to 2008, but other circumstances from a legal pu viewpoint making things any easier. My question becomes a technical one to the representative of the, of the Constitutional Court, Professor Nida and Sabino Cassese, suppose that we went down the route of negotiation, as very much uh, seems to be the best way forward, and would be an agreement, which would have necessarily to be translated into some kind of legal formula that would be uh, practical at the domestic legal level. And as just described by Professor Nida, the 238 sentenza was couched in very rigorous terms to the extent, that, as you said, that no constitutional piece of Italian legislation could override this declaration of incompatibility. Now, your words, Professor Onida, very much are very reminiscent of transitional justice in international law. Uh, and constitutional law. There again, take Latin America. The, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights prevented certain constitutional arrangements of truth and reconciliation commissions because they were against the fundamental right to access to justice. Now my question is, what if the day after tomorrow, Germany and Italy came up with an excellent agreement whereby compensation administrative commissions would be put in place, and Italy has a robust legislative and administrative practice to that effect. With former colonial countries, Italy has suffered damages in the late 70s, 
and Italy has passed legislation set up administrative commissions for compensation and damages have, have been made good of. Now, suppose that there would be some kind of statement of satisfaction, some symbolic kind of um, reparation. Would such a law implementing this international agreement between Italy and Germany run the risk to be brought before the Constitutional Court once again and the Constitutional Court standing in the way of mutual international agreement? Question mark. Would we then go back to square one? Is there any risk? or is there any way we can circumvent this risk? Thank you. I do not represent the Constitutional Court here, so I cannot say what the Italian Constitutional Court could say. I left it 10 years ago, but uh, I don't think that uh, an agreement uh, enforced uh, by means uh, of an Italian law or German law could uh, trigger an inconstitution inconstitutionality statement uh, 238 is not uh, a rigid uh, statement whereby state immunity is not valid. Uh, it, it, it is not valid when the claim is for compensation against uh, war crimes. The actual meaning of the uh, judgment is to state that to date there was no effective remedy of uh, the uh, human rights which were infringed. If tomorrow, by means of commissions set up, by means of recognition an alternative remedy, the Constitutional Court should state that that meets the need raised by Judgment 238. So a uh, law that paved the way to further proceedings would not be inconstitutional if this was uh, to compensate uh, victims uh, individually. Uh, is it on? Okay. Christa Mahler Heidelberg. Um, I would make uh, one uh, economic and one political observation. The economic one first. Um, when we're calling for a political solution, Game basic game theory tells us that negotiations will only work when starting positions of negotiating parties are well defined. So is it truly our role to play as lawyers in this uh, controversy to ask for political solutions or is it not rather to keep going the legal discussion and solve that problem that underlies the missing success of political solutions? That's first and economics. Second, on politics, um, as a private lawyer, I have to use the dog metaphor, I have no dogs in that fight, really, but um, uh, I feel that our discussion is very debtor, I mean, um, is very creditor focused. So that's when we, Professor, when you use the passive of saying there needs to be some reconocimiento, you're using the passive because you think you can leave the actor outside of the equation. Now, if we look at if we don't work with abstractions like the Republic of Germany and we look at the actual uh, people that, for example, will, through taxes, make up for the compensation we pay, the picture gets much more complicated, to put it in one phrase. Why should Italian immigrants who came to Germany in the 60s, why should they now pay uh, for uh, Italian um, victims uh, if uh, within the Italian legal framework, they wouldn't. Okay. Uh, we have, from a constitutional point of view, we have, of course, first of all, to look at the legal risks. but. Don't even forget the political risks. First, the legal risk. At this moment, we have a risk of execution of six decisions. This risk, from a legal point of view, um, 
has to be acknowledged by the Italian government because the Italian government in this case would have to indemnify the German one. So this risk has to be registered in the public balance and the balance sheet has to be controlled by European Union in a very drastic way. <laughs> hmm? uh, uh, so this is why it is now uh, up to the government to decide whether to start a negotiation that could uh, get a better legal risk assessment and an economical uh, and, a, and a broader, broader uh, uh, solution for all problems uh, we have in that. Uh, and that, I think, is the, the starting point, and that's the moment because w we are here now discussing on, on that. The, mm, the second question is nevertheless the political risk. And the political risk, therefore I, I would say the political risk is a European risk again. There is a mounting nationalism. And uh, we, we know that certain parties in the Italian parliament are more closed uh, to this question are more interested and other parties are less interested. Uh, and of course, nationalist parties could be uh, um, more interested in that and they could instrumentalize the question. And please do not forget, we even today didn't hear a clear statement of the German government that the there was no use in Bello 1943. Uh, so, uh, please, uh, uh, we want to make the past really past. And uh, uh, therefore, let us focus just the rights question, let, let us just not leave any space uh, to come, come back these uh, very detrimental uh, nationalists' uh, arguments and, and feelings. And this is the box of Pandora. This is the box of Pandora. We have to close. If the German government doesn't want to speak up, <laughs> doesn't, please. Um, yeah, I'd like to come back to something Professor Tomoc had mentioned in the morning. Um, I found that he made a very interesting remark, pointing out that we had barely talked about um, Italy as an actor, and it's exactly that which made me realize that we have also not really talked about Germany as an actor. If, for instance, we had heard from the survivors and from the victims, then they might have told us what kind of an actor Germany was in Masaboto, in Santana di Sassema, um, in Calavrita, in the work camps, and the list goes on, we could talk about it forever. And if we consider that historic reality, then I think there can be no doubt that Germany is, not, is just another equal country, but that it has a very specific and very special responsibility that is both legal, but also historic and moral. Thank you. Maybe the question, why Italian immigrants should pay Thank you. The fact that we cannot ask Italian migrants or um, that the heirs should be uh, compensating uh, for war damages is not the issue here. Even law cannot forget that there is something well beyond uh, the subject matter. There is use as law, there is use to what is right and the essential uh, rights the Constitutional Court uh, referred to uh, pertain uh, to something that no positive legal order can ignore, can neglect. And as uh, to uh, Professor Luther's statement, I insist uh, in saying that uh, the execution, or better, uh, to say that judgment uh, uh, can still be made, can, but they are not going to be executed, is not a solution. 
because uh, even in uh, the European law, Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, the right uh, to a judge uh, is not just to have someone take into consideration or perusing your um, claim, but that uh, judgments are executed, because if judgments are not executed, then uh, it would be um, empty words, just empty words. The problem then is to put in place a mechanism whereby the problem of execution is overcome. Uh, for instance, if um, a solution is found um, during a process, maybe um, all judgments uh, could be suspended uh, so that the solution is uh, defined, uh, is uh, translated into legal norms, and the problem uh, is overcome. And lastly, I'd like to say that uh, Financially speaking, Germany um, took steps, important steps, uh, respective of compensation to victims. Uh, uh, the Commission of Historians that was set up. I'm also the president of uh, Rucho Pari Institution, uh, and uh, I know that uh, we recently carried out a research atlas of Nazi massacres in Italy together with the National Association of partisans uh, in Italy, and this atlas was funded by the German government. So it's not a matter, it's not an issue of money. What is missing here is a chapter, the chapter of victims. We need to give a saying to victims, their presence, even only symbolically, their meaning should be acknowledged. Points with regard well, one could make a quick calculation what percentage of the German population is Italian in the sense that you indicate. Uh, now, you probably arrive at the thing that these people would have to pay 50 euros between now and 2021, which is, I think, ridiculous. I mean, I think this is a point that I would have an easy time to simply ignore. But uh, the, the, I think uh, what is not to be ignored is a point that until now only you made, uh, Valerio, in, in a strong sense. I think the, the, you had the, the, um, the foundation, the 2000 foundation, and I think on the basis of that, uh, the law, maybe some forced a person in Ukraine or in Russia getting a, f a few thousand euros or Deutschmarks at the time for that person was very important. I mean, just consider the economic situation of these people. I think here we talk about Italians mainly living in Italy, a country of the European economic community, a country more or less at the same level of, let's say, uh, richness or poverty. So I think in, in, in the German-Italian relationship, the issue of dignity, the, the recognition that these people have been victimized, that they have suffered uh, uh, injustice, is probably more important than a, a recognition by, uh, let's say, just getting a sum of money. I, I, I mean, I don't want to be naive, but and some of these people might really value or expect uh, financial compensation. But I, I, I simply don't want to give up the belief that for the majority of people, especially the direct victims, who are all will be between 80 and 95 probably. This recognition that they were treated in an inhuman way and they get an apology and they get the recognition is probably more important than 5,000 euros that they will probably give to their grandchildren. I think this recognition uh, does miss, um, is not, well, let's say, the German politicians and judgments also refer to that injustice, as far as I remember. So there. I think what, what would have to be done and uh, remembered is to really take stock of what the existing institutions, like the, the, the various commissions that you have, what they are, have done and are already doing. I don't have a very clear, let's say, uh, understanding what happens, apparently a lot happens already by way of historical recognition, historical uh, of injustices, et cetera. But that, there, there would have to be a very careful stock taking. But I think you all agree that more could be done. 
both by way of uh, recognizing the uh, and, and by by resorting to satisfaction, which of course can also be done by uh, by uh, uh, by some financial. I remember when uh, I was in charge of bringing the uh, let's say organizing the case against the United States in the Lagrange case, and I remember a. A discussion in the foreign ministry. We talked about satisfaction. And then the question was, uh, should we ask for some money from the United States? And I took the view there it would not make a difference if we asked for one dollar or a million dollar. It wasn't a question of the money. It was just the money was supposed to be a token, a token of satisfaction. Of course, at the time, the, the, the people the, the, of the foreign ministry were against, and that was not pursued further. But that's how I see the matter. I have n not really much to, to add to what my both, co uh, both uh, colleagues said. Um, once again, I think that uh, one should not ignore the political difficulties and you uh, referred to also. Um, I think once again, um, explanations and political communication are a, a key element in such a situation. Um, what it should be clearly recalled what uh, where we uh, come from what is the present situation what was the exact significance of uh, the uh, judgment of the constitutional court recall as you uh, said that what was at stake was precisely uh, to get back to the right of the victims uh, to uh, receive uh, as a minimum recognition of their right to uh, get compensation. Um, this is a difficult exercise, but I think that it, it, it could be done by both countries. A and once again, I I'm sorry to insist on this, and I don't want to bring you back the responsibility, but the press uh, should, I think, uh, be very careful in uh, trying to help as much as possible for explaining um, the good faith of uh, the two sides and try to avoid as much as possible uh, false interpretations by those political parties which, of course, would try and take this uh, initiative for uh, protesting and uh, trying to create, uh, uh, again, a, a political mass. I think communication is, in that respect, very, very important. But perhaps you can react to what I said. I don't know whether... <laughs> OK, thank you so much. Somebody talked about, uh, you know, a risk of political forces or groups uh, to exploit this, especially now of uh, upcoming nationalism. And the risk is there. That's why we need to make a quality leap. We should uh, relinquish the field of mutual revenge or legal uh, litigations. And we should say that there is a basic issue that uh, of giving recognition of victims they do. And that would be a great instrument to fight research and nationalism to reaffirm the over and beyond jealousies, rivalries, and national self-interest is something that matters more, namely the fundamental rights of people which are recognized by all our respective legal orders. So we should recall that that's the right value system. So that's why we should take this initiative over and beyond then strictly legal. No, if I can, if I can say something, uh, I am a little bit confused because I appreciate very much what Professor Zima said and what b both of you said about this one that is a sort of moral issue, also political issue, but also a moral issue. But here we are not discussing about a crisis between Rome and Berlin. This is not the euro bonds issue. This is something different. Nobody is taking any initiative about this. So my question is, 
Can we leave the situation as it is? And what, what are the risks if we leave the situation as it is and we wait maybe for a crisis or maybe for the, uh, the situation fizzling out uh, by itself? Uh, I understand that the moral issue is really important. I'm sorry, as a, as a representative of the press, I am not sure that the political leaders in Italy and I suspect also in Germany are very much inclined to take moral initiatives. Mr. Tahino, you are a pessimist. I'm more of an optimist. I think that the establishment uh, or the enforcement of uh, high values as recognized by everyone is always uh, the right way. That's why I invoked uh, that uh, they should be up to the heads of state uh, to take uh, the lead as opposed uh, to the now ruling uh, uh, political uh, rulers such as Merkel or Gentiloni. I think we need to find something to go beyond uh, than uh, parochialisms, because I think uh, that Europe is a risk uh, of crumbling down uh, than uh, driven by this new nationalism. But we should not forget in the 50s of last century, Italy then came to be because of an insight uh, that states, men, people such as Adenauer or Schumann and the Gasperi, who believed uh, in the ability to uh, overcome centuries of hostilities between these states. I mean, the Schumann Declaration said that it shouldn't just be unthinkable, materially impossible uh, to have a new war in this area of the world. That was the right intuition. It was not utopia. It was not wishful thinking. That's why we have Europe now. I mean, there is a new war, but it's a war between judges. That's why a new war not only is it unthinkable, but also materially impossible. And that should be something we think of, I mean, it's a historical issue because we need to reflect on what happened 70 years ago. It's not about uh, apportioning blame because uh, blame is everywhere. Responsibilities are not just on one side. So if we start from this acknowledgement and if we pay recognition uh, to victims who are the bearers of this fundamental value is the politically right way, I think. My name is Lutz Klinkhammer. I was a German a member of the former bilateral commission of the historians, already quoted uh, so many times, and there's no other uh, colleague present actually, so I feel a little bit authorized to speak for our group, which consisted of 10 people, five Italians, five Germans. Uh, but uh, I was a consultant uh, at the Italian parliamentary inquiry as well on the so-called wardrobe of shame, so La Madio della Vergogna, and um, so I have a, a bilateral <laughs> experience uh, as well. Um, the question of how to define victims, there has been uh, a struggle for over 50 years. Uh, which Italians ought to be defined as victims of national socialism and German occupation? And uh, the first definition had been given in 1961 by the bilateral treaty, and, um, and which ought which ought to uh, give an indemnization to the Italian victims of National Socialism. And the Italian, it was a courageous decision, to my opinion, by the German government at this time, against a huge amount of German public opinion to give money to Italians. And the arguments were those uh, we heard already uh, by the German opinion that Germans had been victims as well, the prisoners of wars and the, uh, and the German... Uh, mm, uh, refugees from the um, um, expelled from the from the foreign countries and, and against this public opinion in '61 there was uh, the treaty and uh, um, 
a certain amount of money to indemnize, indemnize uh, Italian victims. But the problem was that uh, the definition of victim had been resolved in the way that uh, only um, deportees to concentration camps and, and, and extermination camps had been, had been indemnized. So there were 330,000 uh, demands and from those uh, number of demands, only 12,000 12, had been accepted. So the rest, 300,000, uh, more than 300,000 uh, were left without any recognition of victim. They felt individually and personally, subjectively as victim. And this problem had been prolonged up to today. We have only now the remnants of this problem because it had not been resolved in 1999 it could have been, but uh, the creation of the foundation, if uh, set, had been a lost occasion for the German-Italian uh, relationship, because Italian victims had been excluded a huge amount by this uh, um, opportunity to indemnize. Um, and this um, problem, because in 1999, there were uh, at least 120,000 Italian demands, and most of those had been refused again. So the, the number is decreasing. Today we have only a few thousand still alive, and if we wait every month, the number is, in, is dim diminishing as well. So the problem is, uh, would be extermin exterminated biologically in a few years. But uh, we have still the juridical problem which is left as a remnant of this impossibility, of this incapacity of the past to resolve the question of the victims. And, and therefore, I think that there ought to be a new political approach uh, as the, the two governments already did it with the installation uh, of a commission of historians, but um, might be there's a need to, um, to apply to a wider extent to what the historians proposed in 2012, because some elements of um, the report had been uh, accepted and translated into uh, several projects, and uh, uh, which are giving a recognition today to a lot of Italian victims, those alive. And to my, um, to my personal experience, uh, that is very well accepted by um, survivors, all those projects, the Atlante delle Stragi, as well as uh, uh, so-called Albo degli Imicaduti. But there is one uh, political problem left, and this is about interpretation of history. And not maybe, not only, so the juridical question is only an effect of different historical interpretations, because, because the, not anymore the, the historical interpretation of 61 might might be overcome today by new, by, by the historical research during the, the last 20 years, and the great number of people left out of each kind of, of treaty and, and, and ref reflection were not the EMI. So the main problem, to my opinion, are not the EMI, but the civilians depo deported by the German armed forces, by the Wehrmacht, directly from their houses, from their beds, into German labor camps, not to concentration camps. And as deportees to labor camps, there had not been, there had not been any form of compensation. So because only the deportees to concentration camps had had, had access uh, to this kind of compensation. So, and this number had been in, in during the 60s, uh, approximately 70,000 people. And Ferrini is only one of those guys who then tried to get his justice uh, in front of the tribunals because it was not possible for him to get a compensation, another a recognition of another kind. And therefore, and the Historians Commission defined this group, uh, th th this group as well, but it still left not only the, the, the the victims of the massacres and the, and the family uh, members of the massacres uh, uh, committed by the German armed forces uh, are now uh, at the tribunals, but mostly uh, those forced laborers, which not had been soldiers at all. 
And so we have to precise the, the group of victims and reflect about uh, the latter, because it, it is a group which already had been um, neglected, because they had no association, uh, no association like ex-deportees, like ex-internees, uh, and, and, and so on. And one of the juridical problems is the non-recognition of this group. And I, I think that uh, the, the proposal made by the historians in 2012, there is one point which has already had been quoted, the institution, installation of a foundation, uh, which could be endowed and installed in order to resolve all problems left, the, maybe the juridical as well. It's not, uh, it had not been written, uh, especially uh, in, in the report, but the possibility to endow and uh, uh, authorize a foundation in such a manner is still, is still uh, possible and would be fruitful because only a bilateral political approach can resolve the problem because the 1999 AVZ approach was unilateral and the 2009 uh, uh, EJH tribunal was bilateral but not uh, but confrontative, so not uh, uh, not in the um, in the right approach of reconciliation. And therefore, I propose uh, to reflect again about uh, this uh, question of a foundation, of a creation of a foundation. Although I see no not enough political will at the moment to to, to manage it, and it, but it was in '61 was the same problem. The Italian government was very reluctant to have the money from Germany because it was not reasonable for uh, internal question of, of, of internal politics, because the money went to people considered to leftist. And therefore, the mm, Christian Democrats governments uh, during the, the late 50s won't accept those money because it went to the wrong. In the 60s with the Centro Sinistra, the, the, the things changed. So maybe today there's still time to reflect about Italian politics as well. and. Uh, and the Historians Commission said it very clearly that there is an Italian co-responsibility and, uh, and a necessity to co-finance uh, uh, such kind of uh, foundation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to make a short reflection on the money because it's been said and it, it's understandable and it must be shared as a, as a bottom line that essentially I simplify. It's not about the money. Now, I think you need to qualify that a little. Uh, first of all, because it's not very wise bargaining starting position to say, don't worry, we're not after the money then it becomes difficult to agree on the form of reparation. Sure, I agree that satisfaction is the bottom line, is essential here, but reparation through compensation is how you make satisfaction credible. Can we really, in this room, guarantee that these people will be happy with a big sorry? I feel a bit uncomfortable to rule that out. Now, the, the problem that we face is that essentially reparation in the form of monetary compensation makes whatever measure it's going to be taken credible because only acts that do not come uh, from self-interest but against self-interest are particularly credible and would probably assuage the violation to human dignity. Now, the problem that we face is that if we ask the people they want the money, they will want as much as possible. The people who will pay, they would like to pay as little as possible. So there is a problem with aligning. There's a problem of amounts. And I think there is a way there, because uh, I don't know whether you have friends that, that like jogging or marathons when they are 40. They get all crazy about it, and they want to put it in a dignified way, and, if, and, and they put it on the internet with their face, and they say, let's donate. I run for charity. I'm going to do the half marathon in Berlin. And when I see that, I think, you want to do charity with my money. 
and I'm a bit skeptical. It's personal. I have a personal rule. I make a donation when they promise they will match any donation they take. Because that means our interests are aligned. Every euro I give, it's two euros to multiple sclerosis or something. So instead of jettisoning the idea of reparation through compensation, why don't we stress possibly the idea that if Italy comes with a pot of money and invites Germany to match that, then we find the right incentives for both parties to be as generously as practicably possible. And if we have a list, that might become enough or not enough. But at least we are not sacrificing these people's claims in this room. I don't feel comfortable doing that. I can well understand uh, that uh, uh, perspective uh, that does without uh, financial compensation is not enough, uh, but it's not here a matter of trying to understand what uh, uh, do individuals uh, uh, want, uh, whether a larger or lower sum. It is a matter of solving the problems of both the German and Italian communities, and if a solution is adopted that can be recognized as satisfactory. Yes, there might be people who say, I'm not satisfied with this amount of money. Uh, it's not enough. That's his problem. Uh, we need a solution that is satisfactory, that does not um, match uh, the objection of uh, the IC. Uh, J that says these uh, there are rights that haven't been uh, repaired uh, before we heard from uh, a representative of the Commission of Historians and the historians are wise enough as to understand what is the essence of the problem and how the problem could be tackled. Grazie. Devo uh, rispondere. Uh, the ability of the media with regard to right-wing or populist movements, which is absolutely true, and uh, there's a great responsibility, I think, but to put it the other way around, I mean, we are talking about a crisis of Europe. Europe is in a crisis. The bits are leaving Europe probably, France not yet, but one may also argue why are we building the new Europe, Europe by looking to the past? I mean, Poland, every Polish government is saying um, we have billions, tens of billions of demands towards Germany. If, if we want to activate, we will do this. And or should we follow the way uh, Professor Luther, I think, suggested, I, I don't want to talk about Schlussstrich, but we are doing what we are, normally nationalists are looking to, back to the past and don't understand the thought of a common Europe. Is it um, a path into the future to look to single events, and the list is very long of German atrocities and whoever, and then uh, building Europe in this crisis in such a way? That was, would be my answer or my question. Yeah, it was once again a, a very uh, pertinent and, 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 and difficult question. Um, if I may answer as a Frenchman, uh, I would say that uh, th there was there was a, a, a book uh, which, had, which was very successful uh, about f 10 to 15 years ago, uh, ago which uh, title was Un passé qui ne passe pas. A past which still is present. And this referred back to uh, the dark past of the French authorities during the Vichy regime and uh, recent developments in uh, the terrible uh, uh, presidential campaign in my country demonstrated that indeed this past does not go away. So one way or the other, uh, the problem is that we have to deal with it and that it is a common task for the historians. I was very interested by what was just said, uh, the, uh, the lawyers, and at the end of the process, uh, the politicians. Um, 
the true question in my view is how long shall we go on in this way? I have no clear answer, but uh, I think one part of it still remains with uh, the situation in which the, victim, the true victims, the direct victims, have been so far left. And perhaps one way to achieve at least to, at, uh, to, to, have, to attempt to stop the process would be to give very quickly indeed for the reasons which were earlier mentioned, uh, access to reparation. I do recognize that the, kind, the sort of reparation, either satisfactory or uh, 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 material, is, is a difficult one. Satisfaction is at least the very minimum, and I, I, I would entirely agree with Valerio. I, I see uh, the, in, uh, the, the interest of uh, the remarks of, of, of Mr. Fontanelli. Um, th this is to be uh, discussed again by all the uh, competent kinds of people, uh, once again historians, lawyers and politicians, but uh, the problem is that we have now to, uh, to be, or they have now to be as fast as possible. Uh, that's a problem. But, but once again, the past is still part of the present. I think Professor Luther was right in drawing our attention to the situation as it is in Italy, and maybe the situation as regards Villa Vigoni, where I was told the, I don't know what the technical expression is, but this, uh, let's say, um, uh, let's say, uh, aviso of uh, attachment is still in the uh, register, right? In the, in the land register, whatever you call it. This is the situation we, fa uh, we, we, we uh, face. Nine, and probably an increasing number of litigations that have come to an end and execution is uh, in, the, in the air. And that is the situation we should tackle now. Uh, and we have to do it. And this situation is different from the situations that we might occur somewhere or not in the future. And that's what we are talking about, Villa Vigoni, the future of Villa Vigoni. Io vorrei dire che qui siamo di fronte a un problema di giustizia, sì, tutti lo riconosciamo. Perché... Faced with the problem of justice, we're talking about rights, we're talking about law, but it is not a matter of compensatory justice that we have to deal with, but it is reparation justice. Even in criminal law, we say that it is not enough to enforce uh, judgment uh, to offset uh, the evil uh, made uh, by the offender, but we should be uh, restoring justice. Uh, we should be healing the wounds um, created uh, historical examples uh, in South Africa uh, and even in Italian criminal law recent experience was of a group of former uh, red brigaders uh, and victims uh, or relatives of victims that uh, for some years now have started negotiating, have started a dialogue with Red Brigaders. Uh, of course, this cannot be uh, calculated a priori, but this is very important to state that uh, real justice uh, entails uh, healing the wounds, a uh, reconciliation is necessary, and this this cannot be achieved through legal action, but uh, by increasing the profile, looking at values, taking the initiatives that can make visible to everybody, mainly victims, that there is an endeavor made to reconcile, an effort of reconciliation. Yes. Uh, now, he, uh, 
I, I, I think that the, the, the historian spoke before, and so maybe we can, we can look a little bit to history. Uh, I remember a, an article on uh, FAZ a few years ago, probably it was uh, 2008, where the, the newspaper, maybe you wrote it, I don't know, <laughs> uh, accused Italy of not dealing enough with its past, the, the fascist. Past. And I also remember the reaction of Giorgio Napolitano that at the time was the president of the Italian Republic against this uh, article. Uh, I think that probably the article was quite right, personally, I think, that the issue is there, I suppose. I suppose. There are two different ways of dealing with the past. One, the German one, that is that has been particularly in the last uh, 20, 30 years, particularly profound, very, very, a discussion very deep. Every day you have, every evening you have on television uh, documentaries about uh, Nazism, about uh, politics, and uh, you discuss it in the schools. There are historic uh, research in, in different institutions, even, even in orchestras. You, you have, uh, just to understand what happened uh, in Germany during, uh, during the Nazi years. And then you have the, the Italian approach that has been a little bit lighter, I would say, in dealing with, with the past. There are two different levels of uh, uh, sins between Germany and Italy probably, but, oh, but still I think that there is a difference. Uh, do you think that this different approach could influence like probably the article on FAZ uh, indicated, uh, influenced this discussion about, uh, about uh, because in some way we are dealing with a past that is a very difficult past for Italy and for Germany. But you have one country that is discussing openly about that, and you have another country that is a little bit more closed to the discussion. Do you think that this is a problem in our understanding and it could also bring some accusation, reciprocal accusation on that, particularly from Germany to Italy? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't understand what you said. And if you could repeat the last question. No, the, the question is, do, do you think that this different approach could influence the discussion between Germany and Italy also on these sort of issues. Uh, how can, I, I, I suppose that the German could say, how can I approach mm, with, the, how can I approach this situation when you haven't dealt with, uh, with your past? We tried to deal with our past, but you didn't. And so there is, uh, a difference of approach in this, uh, in this situation. Is this, is this uh, a problem in, in this situation or not? My answer would be, of course, there is a problem. But some, uh, some political, uh, let's say, developments make me hopeful in that regard, that even such a problem can be overcome. And I refer to the, to the question of the comfort women and the problem that existed for a long, long time between Korea and uh, Japan. And for a long, long time, Japan, I mean, it took some steps, but it, it shied away from a clear-cut apology and it shied away from compensation. Um, and it reached a stage, and, and Korea was also not, let's say, too energetic about uh, pursuing the question. So uh, that developed so far that the uh, Korean, I think it was called the Constitutional Court, let's say a Supreme Court of Korea, told the government that they had uh, violated the Korean constitution by not pursuing the, uh, the, the protection or the, the rights of its own citizens. But as I am informed that very recently, even financial compensation was paid by Japan. And I would consider the, the diff let's say, the skeletons in the backyard, both of uh, Korea and uh, Japan, uh, and the relationship between these two countries to be immeasurably 
uh, uh, more remote than the relations that we have between our two countries. We, at least we have a common historical commission and all kinds of efforts are made to come to terms with, uh, with the past in which uh, our countries were, uh, let's say, uh, engaged in, 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 in a terrible kind of, uh, let's say, togetherness. So I'm, I'm, I don't think that I recognize there's a problem, but it can be, and it can be over. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really grateful to the judges who accepted our invitation and are actually here today. And actually my question concerned their position. Um, we know that after the judgment uh, to create the sentence of 2014, we start to have a wave of judgments condemning Germany. And this is why we're probably, I disagree a bit with Professor Onida, because these judgments somehow recognize the status of victims. What is missing is the compensation part. And here is where we get trapped in what we discuss lengthily in these days. I mean, jurisdiction from uh, execution and um, giudizio di cognizione. So my question is how they should behave. And this, I think, also uh, triggers a systemic problem for the judiciary as such. We really have a judiciary that is condemning right now without really granting any satisfaction. This, of course, is a, is a systemic problem, I think. So I would be really grateful to hear your opinion about that. Thank you. Judges want to speak up. <laughs> eh, um, Carlo De Stefano, uh, Università Roma 3. Uh, following the question of uh, Valentina Volpe uh, on the same topic, I have um, an outstanding doubt uh, about uh, the interventions of both uh, Judge Zima and Judge Onida. Um, so, uh, which ends up in the following question. Is the present and possibly future phase of uh, executive actions against uh, German properties, is this an opportunity, even though a risky one, to cure the wound or the harm as defined by Judge Onida, or is it the occasion for the creation of even uh, um, bigger problems? What's your opinion on this? It was not clear from, the, from your interventions. There was another one? Yeah. 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 Thank you. <coughs> um, good morning. My name is uh, Antonio Fazio. I am I'm a judge of the Court of uh, Pleasance, <coughs> Piacenza. And I'm the one of those bad guys that condemn Germany. <laughs> First of all, I apologize for my English that it's quite rusty, so I, I'm sorry for that. I would like to answer what is our position. Our hands are tied. As a judge, my work is not to uh, give political answers. As a judge, my main part of work is to state to which one of the litigants of the contendents is right or wrong. But that's not the point. And I felt, and I said to the lawyers uh, in the court, in this particular case, this is not the point. I always believed that not all problems can be solved. And this, of the victims of Nazi uh, fascist crimes, is a, a problem that I agree with Professor Onida, cannot be resolved with a sentence. The thing that um, moved me, that uh, uh, that I found remarkable uh, in the case uh, that was presented to me is that um, the controversial started when that broken man was still alive. The actor was 95 years old. He died during the process that started in uh, 
I think, five years ago. And uh, one day, the widow came to me. And she said, she, she was a very old woman, and she said, the thing that hurts me the most is that nobody ever said to my husband, I'm sorry for what we've done to him. And she said precisely, it's not about money. We don't want money. We want the memory. And I think that memory is the, is the solution. A great Italian jurist, uh, Calamandrei, said, if, uh, if you all want to know which is the authentic base of modern Italy, uh, if you want to understand what is the Constitution, if you want to find the Italian Constitution, go and search for it. Search in the places where the soldiers of the resistance against the fascist regime uh, were fighting, where they were buried, where their blood was, um, uh, was spread. This is where Italy was born. And I think that maybe a solution of this problem, a high profile solution, and that means necessarily out of the court, because the courts offers all, always offer a limited perspective. A higher profile solution could be something like Villa Vigoni. It was a place that um, I never heard of, and this is my first time here. And I think I fully understand its spirit, a spirit of true reconciliation, like like the spirit that we need to recover of the, of the great man that Professor Ronida uh, talked about uh, a few moments ago. The fathers of modern Europe. The solution could be probably a um, um, formal statement, a formal treaty of both German and Italy then that could say, okay, this is a new start. Uh, we are sorry, we are both sorry, as German, as Italy, for the horrible crimes of the past. But as Italians, we are not that man that were responsible of doing it, and the same, the same is for Germany. Modern Germany is not the Third Reich. And so I understand that for a contemporary German citizen is quite difficult to understand why should I pay for victims of that regime. It, it sounds quite unfair. And the best compensation, in my agreement, in, in my opinion, the best um, form of uh, restoring, of healing these wounds that are still bleeding could be something that I tried to suggest to Germany, Italy, that was still present um, in my case. Let's try to, mm, to find a place for this man to, uh, to be remembered. Some kind, I don't, th I don't think of a, a monument or uh, some, something that big, but uh, maybe a free, for the students, trip to the place where he, he was prisoned. A solution, the most important thing, 
not limited to the litigants, but open to all people. Who, whoever wants to go that is free to go and pray there, remember, and uh, to quote uh, an Italian poet, an Italian writer, remember that this has been and hope it will not be again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Very impressive. Thank you indeed. Um, if there are not more questions, maybe we could finalize it by your perspective. Who, where are we in five years? Um, not especially the Villa Vigoni. We hope it, the status is like today. But what do you think about the situation regarding to what we heard in five years? Maybe each, each of you, if no. you want, and then. Io sarò ottimista e penso che fra cinque anni sì. In five years there will have been a step made forward. And I'm talking about hiding behind judicial judgments and preventing the enforcement of judgments against the German state. I think that the step forward will be that we've all jointly recognized that there is an issue with Italian victims waiting for recognition. If we then deal successfully with that issue, then judicial disputes will come to an end because we just heard a judge who said, I mean, what can a judge do? But even the Italian judge from Piacenza suggested and the parties involved uh, agreed that the real solution was not for that family to receive money from the German state. Uh, so there was something else missing. So since there's still something missing, then we need to find new forms of restorative justice. And that's, that can only come from uh, politicians or policymakers, and especially for top-ranking representatives of the two communities. As a follow-up to what the judge in particular said, uh, and uh, also to, to, to what you, you uh, reminded us about the difficult political difficulty of dealing with the uh, past, in particular in Italy, um, of course, it, this may sound as only a good wish, but I think this is definitely uh, a case in which the, what I would say uh, in, uh, with using the German term of Aufarbeitung, the way to deal uh, with the past and to overcome the difficulty. Uh, as we know, um, and, and Germany has been very active in the field, uh, can happen within the national uh, 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 frontiers. But in this case, it is really um, uh, a situation in which a political initiative by both countries could help very much in the two countries, starting with Italy, to look back to the past in a positive and active way. And in that uh, 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 context, uh, as it was already mentioned by, by Bruno earlier, uh, we should never forget why uh, the uh, European Union and the initiative of the Founding Fathers uh, has been launched. Thank you. Professor Lasky. Well, we have May of 2021, right? 2021. There will be a, a conference at Villa Vigoni. I hope to be still around, maybe, you know, kind of but, and we will all uh, merrily and happily remember the conference we had here and all the effort that was made. I think you mentioned that the Capite dello Stato, so why not, uh, this would be one possibility, we remember that our heads of state, one of, at least, I don't know what the foreign policy experience of your guy is, but our guy has been the foreign minister. They took up the matter, they carried it forward, a solution was found, and we are all happy and I'll enjoy the red wine and the grappa at night. Uh, I, I think it's been uh, 
three wonderful days and a wonderful conclusion today, the discussion. So I thank you, everybody, and uh, have a good day. Thank you. Yes, so um, on behalf um, of Villa Vigoni, um, together with my colleague from the Max Planck Institute, we would like to thank you all, uh, to thank all individuals and institutions um, who and which made this uh, conference possible. So I would like to thank to the, uh, the IRPA and uh, of course the Max Planck Institute uh, Heidelberg and um, the team of Professor Peters, Valentina Volpe, I would like to mention <laughs> particularly. <laughs> yes. I would like uh, to thank uh, the moderators of the discussion, the participants uh, to the discussion. Um, I would like to thank you all for the concentrated work during uh, these days, for the um, fruitful participation and for the creative uh, suggestions. And uh, I wish you um, a good trip home and hope to see you again at Villa Vigoni. Thank you very much. And now there will be a buffet lunch in the sun. <laughs>